the most valuable. What type of person would you have to be to have thousands of people chanting your name that you are the MVP? The crazy thing is, no matter who you are, when life hits, it doesn't matter who you are. So we build systems to protect people, period. Some things people do are riskier than others, and so, what can we do about that? How do we make something like flying in a helicopter safe? This episode will cover the engineering involved, features, way things can go wrong, and of course, your IRL lessons. This is the Engineering IRL Podcast, a place for engineers in the real world. We try to break down engineering concepts and figure out how to apply them to real life. Let's become better problem solvers, better engineers. This is your host, Andrew Sario. Let's begin. Just before we dive right into it, now, this is really cool. I am proud to introduce our sponsor, and I hope you'll check them out. All the relevant links will be in the show notes and on the Engineering IRL website. Today's episode is brought to you by 3D Hubs. 3D Hubs enables engineers like you and me the ability to get your parts into production in less than five minutes. Get access to 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal, injection molding for either prototyping or production. The interface is so simple, you can even drag and drop your own CAD files straight on the website and get an instant quote. It's that easy. Now, have you ever wanted to see what your own idea or invention could look like? Maybe you don't know where to start, but luckily 3D Hubs is offering listeners of this show a free engineering toolkit. That's right, it's got a total of 150 pages of printable guides, posters and checklists that would help any engineer up their design game. Personally, I like hard copies of stuff, so I printed the PDFs myself and I even put up the poster Design Rules for 3D Printing on my wall. Seriously, you might as well have this in your set of resources. It won't cost you anything and I'll even put a clickable link in the show notes. Just visit www.3dhubs.com forward slash engineering IRL. That's 3dhubs.com forward slash engineering IRL to get access today. Hello everyone and welcome to the Engineering IRL podcast for engineeringinreallife.com. This is revision 38 of the show titled Engineering Helicopter Safety which was sparked by my curiosity on the topic after the tragedy that befell a basketball legend and MVP. Let's see what could have failed. First, let me take you back to Italy, where a man by the name of Leonardo da Vinci, at about age 41, was conceptualizing the very idea of vertical flight, with a design for what is now known as the aerial screw. If you want to see what it looked like, I posted the design from his original notes on our Instagram. He drew that sketch in the late 1400s. Anyway, he spent a fair amount of time studying birds and understanding how it is that they fly. Okay, so flying is inherently quite risky, and we know it is because we don't naturally fly. We have our feet on the ground. And generally we feel uneasy when we're at the edge of a cliff, for example. But when you see a bird fly, you don't think for a second that it's taking a risk. In fact, most times it seems that they are at risk when they are on the ground, on the road, for example. And you, standing? Well, you might say this is low risk. So then, what creates the risk? A risk is basically a situation involving exposure to danger. But what's dangerous about standing next to a cliff? Or being at height? The answer is potential energy. Think of this as the energy an object, in this case you, have due to your height. And you have this energy because of our old mate gravity. Gravity is a continuous force pushing down on you and everything else as well towards the Earth. So strictly speaking, even you walking around is a risk. Now, you generally would say it's safe, but imagine you're walking, right? And then if your entire body just stopped, you couldn't hold yourself up and you fell head first. Now, would you consider it to be dangerous? Sure. But you'll still walk around and consider it safe, otherwise you'd be crawling everywhere. So if safety is super important and reducing risk, why aren't we just crawling around everywhere? You might say, obviously convenience, efficiency, speed, and several more reasons. But, at the end of the day, it's something called risk tolerance and risk acceptance. Everything you do is a risk, right? But for every risk you take, it is outweighed by something else. So, how do we do anything at all? Well, for every level of risk, there needs to be a system or control in place to offset that risk. If you're unfamiliar with the engineering hierarchy of controls, we did an episode on it in revision 23. 
taking control of 2019. But long story short, there are controls you can put in place to either reduce a risk or reduce the impact of a risk. So the car being the easiest example, speed limits reduce risk of crashing and your seat belts reduce the impact of the risk. Okay, And having a trained human, does this reduce risk? Naturally, you would think yes, and it does. Uh, but in reality, they only provide a maximum of like 10% reduction of the overall risk. Okay, let's take off now into the helicopter seat. We'll touch on what its main job is, how it gets it done, some of the engineering controls to make it work in the first place, to provide us context to go into what we can, what can go wrong, to provide us the context to go into what can go wrong, and what engineering controls we have to reduce the chance of things going wrong in the first place. The force of gravity is pushing down. So to fly, you need to generate enough lift, which is the upward force, to counter it. One way to generate that lift is through helicopter blades. This is the primary job of the helicopter, to fly, and to get you in and out of places without the need for a gigantic runway. So what controls do we need to achieve this? Well, essentially what you have is there's four main controls, the cyclic, the collective, anti-torque pedals, and the throttle. Every control mentioned essentially controls the rotors to some extent, the round spinny bit. I'll keep a high level. The cyclic is the joystick thing. You control it with your right hand and moving it forward and backward takes you forward and backward. Left and right, well, you guessed it, left and right. It does it by controlling the pitch of the rotor, which is the angle. Imagine the helicopter blade sitting on top of the helicopter. When that is flat, the force is pushing the helicopter straight up. Now if you angle it, then it'll push it in that direction. Imagine the helicopter tilts forward a little bit and it begins flying forward. Okay, so that's the first control. The second control, the collective. This is on the left hand side and is like a lever you pull up. Think of a handbrake. Before you can really move left, right, forward and back via the cyclic, you need to move up, get off the ground. This is the job of the collective. You pull this control up and down. Wow, we guessed it again. So you can go up and down. Third the uh, anti-torque pedals. This one is a bit weird. In your mind, you already can control the helicopter in all directions, right? Up, down, left, right, forward, and back. But there is another force to contend with. That is the rotational force. So far, we have been talking about the main rotor, which is the, the big blades on the top of the helicopter. The direction that spins, the helicopter also tends to spin. So you need something to offset this force. That's where the torque pedals come in. It controls the little rotor at the back of the tail. So you can face forward, right? Without this, you can imagine the entire helicopter spinning around like a spin top. It, it like, you, there's videos on it and you just basically see the thing spin like a, like a, like Beyblades. Fourth, and this is last but not least, the throttle. Wait, another force to deal with, yes. Uh, that is drag. This whole time we've been talking about the controls. The rotor has been spinning at a constant speed at a certain number of revolutions per minute, RPM. The throttle is like a motorcycle with a twist action on the handle. Every action in the air can add drag to the helicopter, so you need to also maintain the RPMs to maintain controls. So if, even if you're going forward or whatever, you're trying to accelerate, you need a, you need a bit more throttle to maintain that same amount. Now, modern helicopters typically have a device what's called a, uh, a governor, which basically maintains this for you and through another device called the correlator, it increases and decreases the throttle based on your collective, the up and down one. Okay, so that's a bit, quite a bit to digest, but it's a good chunk of information because what you have now is the main function, the flying of the helicopter sorted, right? And most of the engineering and innovations that happened over time, so we'll go through the whole history, um, was about making it easier to achieve said controls. Now between these controls, you can make a helicopter hover, which is actually ridiculously hard. Listen to Micah Muzio on YouTube describe it. So the thing about flying a helicopter is that 
there's no set it and forget it. Oh good, I'm stable. The whole thing's inherently unstable. And then there are complications. So if a little breeze comes from the right side and uh, I have to counteract that to keep the nose straight by adjusting the uh, anti-torque pedals, that changes how much power the tail rotor is using, which means I have to adjust the throttle. And when I adjust the throttle, it changes how much power is going to the main rotor. So I have to further change the uh, anti-torque pedals. And uh, everything affects everything else. If I lift up collective, I have to add left pedal. And left pedal pushes the entire helicopter to the right because of the anti-torque pedals are spinning. And so I have to add left cyclic. This sounds really complicated, and the fact is, it is. That's why uh, you can't just watch a YouTube video and then go fly a helicopter. You really do need proper training. Wow. Did he say inherently unstable? There's no set it and forget it. Oh, good, I'm stable. The whole thing's inherently unstable. Hang on. Let's back things up for a second and let's run through a few key models first before getting to 2020. Taking a 500-ish year leap from Da Vinci in the 1400s to a different time. 30 years after the Wright brothers took flight in the first place in 1903 on their, on their plane. So you're in the 1930s now. Germany had the first functional helicopter called the Fock Wolf FW61. It looked like an old school propeller plane, but imagine there are like two propellers on top of both wings. Then there was the Sikorsky R4, which was the first mass produced helicopter. Kind of like what Henry Ford was to the car industry. Both amazing engineers in their own right, with Ford mechanical engineer and Igor Sikorsky, an aeronautical engineer. The Sikorsky R4 already looks pretty much what you imagine when you think helicopter. Okay? so. A few years later in 1945 was the first commercial helicopter. It's called the Bell 47, which was the same one they used in the TV show MASH. If you remember that show, it's from the 80s. It's, old. it's an old school looking army TV series. Anyways, this model of helicopter is still interesting because some of the ones existing from back then are still considered airworthy today. Hmm, airworthy. Uh, we'll get back to that word a little later. Anyways. The Bell 47s were also used in lunar landing training. Remember how we said hovering a helicopter was really hard? This is why a high pressure situation with many controls, multiple forces to contend with, loud noise, and you need all of your concentration just to hover. There was a TV show on BBC called uh, Astronauts, Do You Have What It Takes? where uh, Chris Hadfield himself on day one flies in on a helicopter and the trainees first test is to try and see if they can hover a helicopter. It's really difficult, particularly for a first timer. Apparently, I haven't flown one as well. But uh, train pilots can hover it, you know, perfectly still, even in an older model helicopter with no governor. But how? Is there more technology like a drone or is it something more mental? I'll answer that in the IRL section. <laughs> when we get to the end. Uh, but we're drifting a little off course now, so let's just jump a little faster now. In 1962, you get the civilian chopper, the Bell 206 Jet Ranger. Basically, think of news choppers. Um, another decade later, in 1974, you get the Sikorsky H60 Blackhawks with twin-engine designs, and damn, these look cool. Really, really slick. I'll put a picture of this on our Instagram as well. Anyways, the next real innovation comes in the early 2000s with some autonomous helicopters. And then another decade after that in 2010, you get the uh, Eurocopter X3, which is the world's fastest helicopter. Which model was the one Kobe Bryant was in? It was the Sikorsky S76B, which this model was introduced in 1977 with its first flight a year later and has been produced ever since and is classified as a medium sized helicopter with twin engines. A couple of extra facts about this specific uh, helicopter, the N72X, well, N72EX, that's the name of it, uh, was manufactured in 1991, so it makes it about 29 years old, and was the 374th build of its kind. So, like I said earlier, a lot of engineering and innovation came into the flying of the helicopter. For example, the rotor and the blades went from rigid to semi-rigid and to fully articulated, with each iteration achieving reduced stress on the blades, less maintenance. Um, and speaking on maintenance, it's similar to a car in that you have your annual checks, you have your inspections based on flight hours. So emergency service helicopters have checks at every 50 flying hours and then a different type of check every 100 plus flying hours. This is just for the maintenance. 
In addition, on the day there would be daily pre-flight checks, which should be logged in uh, turbine engine power assurance checks and test flights. Back to the maintenance. You also have an approved aircraft inspection program and also this continuous airworthiness maintenance program. And there's that word again, airworthiness. This is outlined by the FAA and is, like most standards we have to deal with, it provides a framework to approach the maintenance and also recommendations as well, which includes maintaining a safety management system, the responsibilities, manuals, organization, approvals, uh, schedules, record keeping, inspection times, training. You get the idea. Safety is a big deal. Wait a minute. Does this mean that there has been no real innovation in helicopters in the last 50 years? Well, yes, in a sense, and no. It's similar to cars. If you look at the fact that they are all pretty much four-wheeled vehicles with seats and a steering wheel, yeah, not too much has changed. But in fairness, the rest of the engineering and innovation has come in A, safety, and B, as with everything else, computer technology. Let's have a look at some of these systems. So, one is the flight management system, which is made up of flight plans. Consider these plans as your routes, and it has a navigation database. You can think of that as the landmarks on your map. It determines the position of the helicopter, typically with a GPS. So that's three main things. Routes, landmarks, and your position. That's its job. Next you have dual communications and nav radios, which is essentially your radio systems, aiding helicopter pilots to, uh, with their comms to control towers and more. You have the autopilot system, and you also have an electrical system that powers all the helicopter subsystems. The electrical system powers all the avionics. Avionics is just a term for electronics related to aviation industry. It has some storage for engine startup, and it's also used for the operating of actuators, and then internal and external lights, fans, and other electronics. The N72EX specifically had an iPad, for example, which had its five plans. The avionics of this helicopter had the Honeywell avionics suite and a weather radar. They normally have the black box or cockpit voice recorder and many other sensors as well as the Honeywell ground proximity warning system depending on the helicopter, but uh, the N72EX was reportedly missing these three features. Do I think these three missing features caused the crash? I'll touch on that a little bit later. Finally, some helicopters will also have hydraulic systems, which is essentially for things equivalent to your power steering. Whew. Now, there's a few systems there, and at no point in a helicopter do you really consider all these systems. There's just the pilot. I remember back in uh, 2012, I went on a helicopter flight over New York City with my now wife, and I have to say it was pretty darn awesome. It was a really cool experience. Even um, just heading out and jumping into the chopper, the sounds, you know, it was noisy and you certainly needed those headsets. I do remember feeling a little bit nervous, but never unsafe. You could kind of feel all the forces in a sense, you know? I mean, like in comparison with a plane and everything felt more real time. Sitting right up front, you could kind of see everything and a little bit below you as well. So you got a real sense that you were indeed flying in the air. In a plane, you only get to see out your small window and because of the size, it feels quite stable, right? Um, anyways, for our helicopter flight, our pilot was casually speaking to air traffic control and talking about how he was low on fuel and needed to refuel at some point. Can you imagine on an airplane buckled in? Attention passengers, this is your captain speaking. We are running low on fuel and will be needing a refuel later this flight. I was like, huh, you didn't fill up, what? But at the same time, like, he was calm, right? So his calmness and his, uh lackadaisical demeanor instantly made me think this guy knows what he's doing after all he's in the same vehicle so i just continued to enjoy the flight and all the views it was really cool anyway these guys are well experienced they have constant comms with air traffic controls and they are calm as heck i'm not thinking about any fancy controls or computer power under the hood now speaking of under the hood i'm going to get a touch technical here but i'll try to keep it simple there's two main computer processes to consider here the first is the flight director. The flight director's job is to take all the raw data, air data, nav, radios, altitude, course, vertical gyro, and feed it into the flight director computer. The other input is the flight director mode selector by the pilot. It feeds this as an output as flight commands to the pilot or to the autopilot. 
Basically, it takes this raw data and performs calcs to spit out steering commands to keep you on course. It's like the uh, GPS in your car, telling you where to go if it were guiding both the directions and how to steer. Taking us to our second computer process. This is the autopilot. Autopilot is more about the stability of the helicopter, helping you fly, but not making decisions on where to fly. You remember all the focus and effort it takes to hover? It helps this. Uh, its sensor inputs are the vertical gyro, compass gyro, and an air data computer, which feeds into the autopilot computer. The controller here checks where you think you are versus where you should be, and uses this error or difference to control. It's a control loop, basically. The outputs are to the servos, which is the motors running the four main controls we talked about at the beginning of the episode. With the autopilot and flight director handling all of these controls, the pilot can now worry about other things like comms, navigation, weather, monitoring. It means the pilot has less of a chance of being the root cause of a helicopter crash. So this episode is not intended as an investigation of any kind and is meant to just try and understand what engineering goes into a helicopter and what are the safety features that can help reduce the risk of flying. Let's explore some faults and their mitigations. And after that, we can look at what was missing on the N72EX. A large portion of keeping things safe is avoiding collisions in the first place. And to do that, you need information, sensory information, including vision. The crash of N72EX, for example, is, is reported to have been flying through some heavy fog. Actually, there's something called a cloud ceiling that tells you how high the clouds are. So... For most of the flight, it was at 1,000 feet, which is about 300 meters. And the pilot was flying below this. Towards the end, near the airport where it was circling, they updated the cloud ceiling to 1,500 feet, or about 450 meters, and the pilot raised his altitude but was still below this ceiling. The thinking is that if there was a dip in this ceiling, it could have caused disorientation of the pilot. More on this later. The other big failure that could happen is an engine failure. The odds of that are quite low, and an engine failure on two engines, even less. But let's say you did have a dual engine failure. Will the hunk of metal just drop out of the sky? I mean, the engines are literally what's keeping the helicopter up. Well, turns out uh, this isn't necessarily the case. You see, pilots are trained to do what's called auto-rotation. So you know how we said the spinning blades give you lift? Well, a helicopter in the right glide angle can use the wind as it falls to spin the blades, which, like we said, gives you lift, the force you need to counter the gravity. So I once had a uh, work colleague that owned a glider. A glider is a small one-person plane that has no engines. It's just metal with wings, pretty much, and a seat. He would get towed up by a bigger plane into the sky, and then once high enough, the rope cut off. He would rely purely on aerodynamics and physics to glide through the air and he could stay up there for three hours before landing with zero requirement for fuel. And you know what's interesting is one of the other listed top failure types for flight is a lack of fuel. Anyways, so all in all, the uh, different types of deciding factors related to the faults are generally collisions, engine failure and fuel. Now let's look at a couple of safety features and controls and then break it down into some engineering terms. And then what I'll do after that is I'll compare that with the tragedy of N72EX and see if any controls would have made the difference or not. Just keep in mind this is merely an exercise of looking at the different engineering that goes into a helicopter for function and safety. All the detailed reports won't go out on the event for quite some time actually. Engineers use what's called the hierarchy of engineering controls to assess and consider solutions that reduce risk. Now there are five main types and a control in each one of these layers will decrease your risk. Each layer helps to reduce risk but have progressively less impact. So at the top, the best way to reduce risk is to completely eliminate the risk. That means don't use a helicopter equals helicopter can't crash. You know that meme <laughs> where he points to his head. But see, this isn't always practical. So you move down the list of control types that doesn't completely remove the risk, but it does still allow you to still fly the helicopter with some sort of trade-off. 
Okay, so you have the third layer called engineering controls. That is like uh, physical or mechanical things in place that reduce things going wrong. Traditionally, this is a fence around a hazard, for example. But in the case of a helicopter, these are things like the governor, flight director and autopilot. You probably also have limits built into the electrical systems and the uh, engine. Typically, in high-risk environments, you would have multiple controls in this category. Next, uh, you have the fourth layer, the administrative controls. Usually this means uh, like signs that say, don't trespass. But for helicopters, it's more like the comms to the air traffic control telling you, hey, you're flying too low, or there's two other vehicles waiting for landing. And also, all your sensors and systems that feed information to the pilot, these are considered administrative controls. Having these in place does reduce your risk, but only by so much. Why, you might ask? Well, okay, so compare this with driving up to a stop, you know, a traffic stop sign. Put yourself in a car right now, visualize this, and try to imagine what would be happening for you to ignore this stop sign. So you're driving down the road, you see a stop sign. What, what would it take, like, for you to miss it? Or for you to see it and still not stop? If you're not going to stop at the sign, in the first place, would a second sign really stop you? How about a third? How about if you had 10 signs saying stop? In all odds, if you miss the first for whatever reason, that reason is likely high enough to miss even more signs you didn't see in the first place. So like we said, the traffic control comms is one of these controls. They would likely be telling you some information about where things are in the airspace. They can tell you, but even with that information on hand, you can still take actions that lead to a collision. So when there are reports, for example, that the N72EX, Kobe's helicopter, didn't have the terrain awareness warning system to hint at a missing safety feature that would have prevented the crash, I had to think of it in terms of the hierarchy of engineering controls. Is it a missing engineering control or a missing administrative control? The TAWS is in fact the Honeywell ground proximity warning system I mentioned. It's not like a sonar system, that's what I thought it was initially when they when they described it, like it's sensing when you're close to colliding with something. But it turns out it's more like uh, it takes all the existing telemetry data, you know, about where you are, and it compares it to a database that has terrain information. It's like your GPS says you're at these coordinates, and then our database says that's close to a mountain at these same coordinates. It does sound like this feature is exactly what was needed to stop that crash certainly makes a good headline, but not exactly. Remember what I just said about the hierarchy of controls and how administrative controls are equivalent to stop signs giving pilot information to stop. This is the same thing. It falls in the same category. That is, if there are other indicators or systems on the helicopter that already gave any indication that something was wrong, let's say the flight director was showing off course or the gyro or GPS weren't showing nominal readings, i.e. another one of the stop signs, then the reduction in risk from yet another sign telling you a similar, similar thing, i.e. a second stop sign, is extremely low. Maybe it makes a difference, true. And personally, I'd prefer to have one on board. But again, without knowing the root cause, if something has gone wrong before a crash, another beep that says you are going to crash won't change the outcome. Now you might think, what would upgrade this from just being an administrative control and becoming an engineering control? Something that could actually have a chance at reducing the risk. This would be if that system fed into the autopilot system. Now it becomes an engineering control. Again, this doesn't guarantee anything either, but there are reports of pilots complaining that the system actually is a distraction. Wait, how can a warning system be a distraction? Well, particularly if you're flying in a high density area, say a mountainous area with lots of buildings and other vehicles like in LA, everything is in proximity. Warnings are always going off. The counter argument has been that a safety feature shouldn't be excluded because it's annoying. Not when lives are at stake. However, I can empathize with these pilots. I mean, I've used warning systems before and alarm systems before in a completely different context and a different scenario, but the thing to note here is that having too many alarms is as bad as having no alarms at all, because now you ignore all the alarms, even the important ones. Okay, so then what's the solution? 
The solution to this is typically not the alarm system itself, right, but the alarm management. So perhaps this is an area for engineers to look at with the TAWS. Don't just plonk in the warning device to meet a requirement. It needs a better look at its interface with the pilot. Now that we've covered some of those safety controls, if you want to understand root cause, you need to increase the considerations regarding the incident. The other thing is you can see that there was definitely something to look at with the procedure and potential communications issue. The switching of shifts between air traffic controllers at some point when the switch happened, we know radio comms dropped due to flying too low for the radio signal. Then, we also know from the flight data that there was a rise above the clouds, a deviation from the flight path, a left turn, and then a descent prior to the fatal impact, which was described as a high energy impact. In over 8 seconds, its descent rate increased to 4,000 feet per minute, with the debris from the site having a football size spread. Now, just quickly before moving on to the analysis, to touch on the last layer of control, the fifth layer, typically PPE, also known as personal protective equipment. In a car, it's your seatbelt, airbags, crumple zones, and other times in, you know, a, on a site, it's helmets, high visibility clothing, safety boots, etc. For a helicopter, sure, there are seatbelts, but is there airbags, bumpers? The problem is it's not that simple. Airbags, for example, can be triggered by turbulence, which a helicopter experiences more regularly than a car, plus all the added weight for that equipment. But again, if they're actually a good solution, the question will come around risk acceptance. There's definitely space for innovation in this area, and I'll rope some upcoming innovations in the IRL section right after the analysis. So in summary, at the end of the day, there are two main factors in safe flight. That is the technology and the human. With the technology comprising of mechanical, electrical, fuel, and instrumentation failures. As far as the technology that is actually available, I think the engineering and the technical systems in place actually met the requirements. But uh, that's not to say that there shouldn't be better technology available in the first place. I'll be specific on the technologies that should be available for all helicopters shortly. But technology-wise, it is a well-known brand. As I've shown that, you know, the, the Sikorsky brand has gone from like very early days of helicopters and uh, it's a proven helicopter model as well. Engine technology is there and feature wise it was equipped. Any of these pieces of technology could have failed though. I'd be guessing that there was some equipment failures but likely not any of the big pieces. Next is the human. There's still a reduction in risk by having a fully trained and qualified pilot. In the case of Kobe's pilot, he had 8,000 plus hours of flying experience. You would think this fits the bill, but you have to remember that there is also human error to consider regardless. The FAA reports that the helicopter crash rate is 9.84 per 100,000 hours. That's about one every 10,000 hours. Higher than planes, lower than cars. But here's the thing, both the technology and the pilot require input data to function well. All of this was exacerbated by low visibility, heavy fog, a potential dip in the cloud ceiling and it's not likely it was an unflyable situation from takeoff, it is more likely that a change in conditions to the point where emergency response did not fly any helicopters out to the site. In that case, the pilot's sensors, human sensors, are blocked and all he has left to rely on is the systems to provide the information instead. Disorientation. Can you imagine being lost in 3D space, not knowing where up, down, left, right, forward or back will take you? You're driving and you close your eyes. Everything goes black. When you open your eyes, you only see fog. Your headlights only make things worse because it's reflecting off the fog. It's blinding. It's loud and you can only hear the engine. You're disoriented. You're probably going to slam the brakes and stop and try to figure out where you are to reorient yourself. The pilot needs to orient themselves first with their own human senses and then with the information from the helicopter systems. If human senses weren't available and then the sensors provided wrong information or the flight director had an error, it also is possible that the guidance reported to turn left instead of right, for example. Then in a moment of visibility, the pilot realizes something is wrong and has to make a quick decision. Another wrong turn takes place and everything stacks up on top of each other from there. Remember, this is speculative, but I'm just trying to paint a picture where you have all these controls in place, but you have individually small errors that on their own aren't the biggest deal, but when stacked up, could cause a big problem. 
Now, it may not have been failed sensory input information. Humans make mistakes all the time, and it may not have been a mistake, but the best reaction, given the circumstances, the circumstance could involve some mechanical or instrumentation fault. Who knows? But I can only stick to the facts. So I'll provide a link that has all this data and visualizations of the flight path. It's quite comprehensive. And seriously, you should kind of take a look at this flight path. It appears to be following course, then goes off, and then a left, a bit towards a hilly area, then goes further left into more hills while the road was veering right. You can also see it uh, raise its altitude and then drop it again as it's following through. And prior to this whole thing, you can see a pretty steady path and you can match up where the comms to the radio tower would be. And it's, it's, it's really kind of mind-boggling how communication stops at the same time as these deviations were occurring different behaviors and different actions taken and you just try to piece these things all together but you have to you have to not overreact to any small piece of information just because you have a conclusion you want to meet anyway click the link in the show notes or on our website to see what i'm talking about it's aviation-safety.net forward slash wikibase forward slash 232468. Then let me know what you think, right? You can reach us on the socials or whatever, but what I do know for sure is humans are humans, but the technology could be and should be better. There is one major thing from an engineering perspective I believe needs to be looked at with helicopters, and it's an issue across the board. What I imagine and would urge is that the immediate future technologies be complete redundancy of vital components as a minimum requirement, similar to planes. Let me make the quick case here. In everything that I've spoken about so far with risk, with risk acceptance and the failures and safety controls, we know that helicopters present to us a situation with high potential energy, complex systems, and most importantly, multiple human lives. As this is the case, I would expect the safety on board be comparable to an airplane. Wouldn't you agree? The fact of the matter is, even with dual engines, it's still a single gearbox. There are many pieces that are single points of failure in this thing. And I'm talking about vital pieces, critical path. One of the first things engineers do with any high-risk venture is a HAZOP. Right? The definition is a hazard and operability study, which is a structured and systematic examination of a complex planned or existing process or operation in order to identify and evaluate problems that may represent risks to personnel or equipment. Out of that exercise, you usually determine what should be redundant to significantly reduce mechanical failure. Even with the counter argument that perhaps this was already done and the assessors determined it was not required to be a redundant to have redundant systems given that the biggest areas of fault are what i mentioned the human and the technological that is operational and mechanical faults with the cost being human lives it is clear to me that at a minimum all critical components on board should have redundancy you might say wait cars have a higher crash rate and you'd be right um, it is significantly higher as i mentioned earlier but there's another vector uh, which these assessments are done Risk is measured by both the frequency and by the impact. The inherent potential energy for flying vehicles is higher than that of ground vehicles. When everything fails in a car while driving, at least you're already on the ground, with virtually no potential energy in the up and down direction. The final argument here is the cost. And this is a biggie, right? I understand that. But this is specifically why I'm saying that there needs to be innovation on this front. Anyways. Other innovations are fly-by-wire with some big players doing tests with this in 2020. You have alternate VTOL modes of transport, um, vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, take a look at our Instagram page to see a video on what Boeing has going uh, with vertical takeoff planes. Looks so cool. Also, there's another way to look at things. And the second layer in the hierarchy of engineering controls that I haven't touched on yet. You know, if you go back to the section, I talked about layer one three, four, and five, um, but layer two is substitution. So another mode of transport that could be safer, for example. The advantage of the helicopter is twofold. One is getting flight access to areas that other vehicles cannot, particularly emergency services and things that take advantage of this. And the other is traffic avoidance for shorter distance. 
So when you are in the case where you need to get to those areas that other vehicles cannot, then you have to take that into the risk evaluation and say, we need to go here, right? There is no alternative. So you take on that risk. But if it's mostly for this traffic scenario, then maybe looking at substitutions for that needs to be a bit of focus. So for example, maybe more tunnels or other traffic avoiding means of getting places like what Elon Musk's boring company is trying to do or the Hyperloop. Who knows what comes next? Now, if you want to go a little bit more outside of the box, um, it's more of a virtual and remote work taking place that reduces the need to commute in the first place. And that causes the traffic, right? So less people requiring to be on the roads for work will mean less traffic. I'm serious. These are real considerations. You have to think, not just, you don't want to try to solve a problem and then lock yourself in by framing the question a certain way. If you listen to the previous episode, the systems engineering episode, there I walk through the systems engineering method and you really need to ask the right questions. That's kind of one of the key things. And understand that by asking questions in certain ways, the way you frame it, might be locking you into only a limited amount of answers. Okay, next is improvements in standards that have requirements on more technology on board, uh, better sensors, better controls and autopilot, better data systems and tracking that can really 3D map where you are and what obstacles there are. Some of these technologies are only coming in now, but they're way behind airplanes. Same industry though, right? In any case, awareness is huge. And safety at the end of the day is a cultural mindset. Will this event and others like it mean safety culture is more embraced? In reality, maybe not. But that doesn't mean we won't try. After all, this is one of the most important aspects of being an engineer. So now that we've come back to reality, let's extract some IRL lessons. Um, the first is derived from newbies trying to hover a helicopter. Turns out the key advice for people trying to learn to do this is to chill. Don't over control. Stability can only come after this. The second you think move the control, you've already moved too much. What I'm saying here is that overthinking about it, you will never be able to maneuver in life. Overthinking what, you ask? Well, I'll let you come up with that answer. But for me, for example, even with this podcast, I have to practice my schedule so I don't overthink and I just record, just take action. Maybe you're trying to control an outcome and you keep thinking about it when you should be just focusing on execution. Only then will you feel somewhat in control of the outcome because the outcome will end up coming. Number two, understanding your own risk acceptance. This is a bit tricky one, but uh, you might have accidentally created an informal logical fallacy. In one area of your life, you say, don't do this because of this risk. Yet in another area of your life, take that same risk but brush it off because of some other benefit right in reality what you've done is applied a contradicting risk tolerance maybe you haven't started some project because you think it's too risk like since it might cost you a bit of money to start a project to get some base materials you stop yourself from taking it on but if it had an immediate satisfaction like let's say buying a, a video game that you've always wanted well that money isn't risky at all for some reason even though there's a chance you don't like that game you might say nah I'll definitely like the game, so I'm buying it. And even if I don't, I could sell the game. So you've got an out. But, you know, you could apply that exact same logic to the project you wanted to start. Maybe it fails, but you could always sell some of the materials that you bought in the first place. Maybe you're holding yourself back for no reason. The last is visibility matters. So what are your blind spots? You can't achieve anything of significance if you aren't aiming at something. And you can't aim at something that you can't see. With that being said, thanks for listening to this episode. If you could, please subscribe to the podcast and let us know that you did. I'll do a shout out on the next episode. And if you're an iPhone user and listening via Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review. It helps us out tremendously. And more importantly, it allows me to make more episodes. Shout outs to our sponsor, 3D Hubs. Don't forget to pick up your free engineering toolkit, compliments of our partners, and you can download it for free at 3dhubs.com forward slash engineering IRL. That's 3dhubs.com forward slash engineering IRL. If that's too hard, you can find all the related links and information in the show notes for this episode or on the website. Your engineering toolkit is just a click away. Any questions or requests, just email or DM on any of our socials. 
we're going to be running a uh, Instagram giveaway soon. So make sure you follow us at engineering in real life, one word, so you don't miss out.